Good afternoon and welcome to the winter 2023 LVHS member slash community meeting. We appreciate you braving the weather for David Allen's presentation. It will be worth it. My name is Kathy Kalusek and I'm membership chair. Our president, Sherry Best, had a medical procedure last week that went very well, but she needs a little more time to recuperate, so I'm covering for her today. I'd like to take a moment to have um, one of our board members, Marv Weston, give us an update on our truck that we're working on restoring. Thank you, Kathy. Good afternoon. Thank you for any of the uh, uh, things that you're purchasing or donating and that uh, if you were wondering what it all goes to, uh, we have been for the last year and a half uh, restoring a 1938 international truck. This truck was a part of the history of Laverne, spe specifically the orange industry. It was owned by Inman Conady. Inman was the second president of the Historical Society, and we acquired this truck. Uh, it had been sitting in a shed up in the Heritage Park area for some time. After we were able to uh, get it out of the shed, uh, eventually it made its way to Benita High School and we had students working on that and it really has been a wonderful uh, uh, community effort, uh, particularly having our young people uh, having knowledge of something that goes back that far. And uh, we've uh, also uh, had it at a professional uh, repair shop uh, that specializes in uh, uh, historic vehicles. So it's been a very costly thing to try to get this thing back on the road. Our goal is when 4th of July parade comes up this, uh, this year that you will be seeing that truck running on its own power. So anything in which you are participating on, be it the jelly or the books, uh, uh, the 50-50, uh, 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 this is all part of the fundraising that's helping us to uh, move forward in, with that truck. And so we thank you so much. David Allen has been writing for the Inland Valley Daily Bulletin for 25 years on such topics as people and places, arts and culture, area history, and local government, including far too many city council meetings. His columns, which have been collected in four books to date, now also appear in the San Bernardino Sun and the Riverside Press Enterprise, expanding his territory to the entirety of the Inland Empire. He lives in Claremont, which means we can greet him as a good next door neighbor. Ladies and gentlemen, David Allen. Oh, that was a neighborly welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, I live next door in Claremont. I swam over today. <laughs> um, you know, like, it's actually, you know, not as bad as, uh, as it seemed. But, you know, when you look at, you hear the weather report or you look at the app on your phone, it'll just say, you know, rain. You know, it's like rain Monday, rain Tuesday. Rain Saturday, rain Sunday, rain Monday. But you don't necessarily know that how much rain that is. It might be that it's gonna drizzle while you're asleep. It might be that it's gonna rain all day. You have no idea. So I was uh, certainly <laughs> uh, anxious the last couple of days about <laughs> what the conditions are gonna be like today. Um, also when uh, like I was dealing with Sherry uh, best on this and she told me by email the other day that they were going to set up 100 chairs and I thought well actually I replied to her and I said you know I try to keep my expectations low for these things so that I can be surprised so you know for all I know there's going to be 99 empty chairs and Sherry in the back applauding um, <laughs> but here I am two things one there's about 50 of you and two Sherry's not even here. <laughs> like the one, the thing that you think you can count on and it doesn't happen. So that's why I keep my expectations low. But you've, thank you for, <laughs> thank you for coming out, braving the, I can't even, I don't know if I, it's even raining yet. I don't know if I can say that it's, you braved the rain. You braved, you know, the clouds. <laughs> um, so there's like two kinds of events generally that, that I'm asked to do. I mean, sometimes they're just like service club, breakfast or lunches. 
uh, or sometimes they're an event like this that is at least primarily built around me being here. Um, you know, like the service club things, like those are nice. Like um, they're, I'm just, a, I'm just the featured entertainment <laughs> or whatever for, you know, 30 minutes of it. Um, I know there's going to be an audience because it's a regularly scheduled meeting. I just happen to be the person that is there to talk and I get a meal. Um, you know, it's always chicken. It's never very good, but you know, it's a meal. I'm not going to turn my nose up at it. Um, but you know, also time is somewhat limited uh, for that because they have to, you know, find people and, you know, <laughs> conduct their business and whatever and get people out uh, back to jobs or the sofa or what, wherever they're going. Um, so the events like this are kind of cool because, you know, I mean, first, very gratifying that somebody wants me to come and, you know, they think that I'm going to be a draw, uh, but also a little bit nerve wracking because nobody really has to be here, uh, unlike a service club lunch. Um, you know, so it's completely dependent on a bunch of individual decisions out there in the community that I have no control over. So. You know, sometimes I draw well, and some I've had an event where I drew one person <laughs> at a library once. Uh, and, you know, you always feel like this is, I don't know, I mean, you can't help but kind of slink away, feeling like you've uh, failed, you've let everybody down, but it's out of my hands. Um, but even, there was a Twitter thread of a few weeks ago of like famous authors were talking about doing book events and like having nobody show up or having one person show up. I mean, this is like best-selling writers at a bookstore and like nobody would show up despite promotion and how like humiliating it was or how like the one or two people who came got a lot of attention <laughs> from the author. Please ask me another question. Um, anyway, so that's all to say like it's very it's very nice to have, know that even though there's a hundred chairs, there's at least half of them are filled and that you all took the time to come. So thank you. Uh, I'm gonna um, read from my latest book, uh, which is 100 Years of the Los Angeles County Fair, 25 Years of Stories. Uh, and then after that, I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about how it came to be. And then after that, I'll take questions. Um, just to let you know if you, think of questions you can ask. Uh, usually that's the best part of this. It's not uh, me reading, it's the questions and being able to hear what you have to say and respond. Um, so, um, so March is gonna be my 26th anniversary at the paper. Um, and then April will be like 36 years in journalism. Um, I've been um, writing columns for most of that time. Uh, and since 2014, I've done three other books of my columns uh, from a local publisher, uh, Pomona A to Z, uh, which is uh, like 26 columns that are one for each layer of the alphabet about something that was unique about Pomona. Uh, Getting Started, which is um, kind of the best of my columns from the first uh, four years I was doing them, 97 to 2000. Uh, and then On Track, uh, which is kind of the best of my columns from 2001 to 2005. Uh, so we had all these done, you know, 2014, 16, 18, I think. And then 2020, I was starting to work on what was going to be the next one, which I was reading columns from 2006 up through 2012 and making notes on, you know, what ones might be good, which ones should be forgotten. Uh, and then um, was, so we probably would have had a book finished by the end of 2020 or so. I was working on it the first couple of months of the year and then, you know, pandemic, perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, and, you know, it was like, there's no point in doing a book now because, you know, probably 95% of the copies of all these things, it's been me selling them directly to people at events, you know. So there's no events, there's, you know, this is like the tree falling in the forest and nobody's there to hear it. There was no point in doing a book besides I, you know, had other things on my mind <laughs> during the pandemic than, than worrying about a book. It was more like, how am I gonna write three columns this week when there's like nothing, no events, <laughs> can't really meet in person with very many people, you know, that was 
um, quite a challenge. Uh, and then that's when the paper decided to like start expanding my territory. So I was covering San Bernardino and then Riverside County. I'm like, all right, but <laughs> I can't, there's nothing happening. Uh, so big challenge. But then um, like late in um, what, 2021, I uh, met with my publisher um, in Upland and you know, we were talking a little bit about the next books. He'd said, yeah, don't worry about it, you know, but um, I said, you know, I have this idea that I've been thinking about just doing a book sometime of all my LA County Fair columns and stories, because there are a lot of them. I've been covering the fair like every single year since I got here. Um, and the 100th anniversary was in 2022. So I thought it would be kind of neat to do a book for the 100th anniversary of the fair, but you know, that's like six months away. Like, could, is that possible? Is that, could we do it, a book that quickly? And he said, yeah, we can. We will have to, we'll cut some of the processes out, but we can do it. So um, I got copies of every single thing I did about the fair. Uh, we input whatever ones weren't online, available, already electronically, which is, I guess, was most of them, uh, and um, put them in chronological order, basically, and it kind of tells the story of the last 25 years of the fair, in a, in a sense. And we got it done. Um, it was published on May the 1st, which was the first day of the 100th anniversary of the fair, so um, it worked out great. <coughs> I mean, it didn't help that the fair moved it moved from fall to spring. You know, like I gave us a little bit less time to work on it than we might have liked. Um, so let me uh, let me read you a few. <clears throat> All right, this one's from 2002, and the headline is "Healthy Lifestyles at the Fair." Yeah. Concerned about health impacts on fairgoers from the deep-fried Snickers bar on a stick, I popped into the LA County Fair's first aid center, notebook in hand, hoping to get an accurate count of fatalities. Medical coordinator Dean Gross, who oversees the 25-bed health facility, conveniently located near a fat burger stand, checked the log for me. I haven't had anybody in here for deep-fried Snickers on a stick, concluded Gross who it should be pointed out as a trained medical professional. What about injuries from foods on a stick? For instance, someone walking with stick food, tripping and poking themselves? Not that I can recall, Gross told me. He had, his staff had, however, already seen 833 people for Band-Aids, aspirins, and antacids. <laughs> yes, antacids for fair food. If you eat something that doesn't agree with you, Gross said, we can give you Rolades, Alcoth Seltzer, or if you need it, Pepto-Bismol. No, Pepto-Bismol does not come on a stick. <laughs> when digestive problems arise at the fair, Gross explains, sometimes it's the heat in combination with the food, and sometimes, as you'd expect, it's just the food. Concessionaires get more creative every year. Last year, Gross said, they had deep fried dill pickles. I almost asked him for Rolades based on the name alone. <laughs> All right, going back even a little bit farther, this is from um, 1999 and actually from August, so shortly before the fair started. <clears throat> With a roar, three dinosaurs swept through the streets of Laverne on Wednesday, heading for the population center of Pomona on a flatbed truck. Sadly, the dinosaurs weren't here from the misty dawn of time. They were here from Irvine. The remote-controlled reptiles were bound for Fairplex, where they'll be the main event at next month's Los Angeles County Fair. 50 dinosaurs will set up home in a 43,000 square foot jungle for an attraction called Dino Quest, which fair officials say will be both edifying and terrifying. Exhibits manager Kathy Wadham said, they all move. We have one that actually pumps blood. One spits, they all breathe. None of them are reported to eat little boys and girls, but the fair might want to review its liability coverage just in case. 
The first trio of dinosaurs, for the record, is Stegosaurus, an Amargosaurus, and a Parasaurophilus. <laughs> Arrived on Wednesday, and more will show up in the coming days, fair spokesman Sid Robinson said. The fair runs from September 9 to 26. Dynamation, an Irvine company that specializes in animatronic dinosaurs, is supplying the dinosaurs for the $500,000 attraction. A 28-foot truck carried the docile dinos up Highway 57 to Laverne, where, for publicity's sake, they were propped upright for the final leg along Foothill Boulevard, D Street, and Arrow Highway to Fairplex. Topped by a blue fin, the head of the Amargosaurus hung over the truck's side gate, leering at motorists, perhaps to show his displeasure over their use of fossil fuels. <laughs> the long neck of the Parasaurolophus leaned over the truck cab, Protecting their back, the Stegosaurus glared at drivers to the rear. Reaction varied. A boy skating along Foothill stared, open-mouthed. Two pedestrians crossed D Street at their own pace, unheeding of the risk of delaying a truck loaded with dinosaurs. A landscaper downtown stopped work to watch the truck rumble by. Two young girls on D Street pointed in amazement. Motorists on Foothill craned their necks for a better view. Other motorists, though, impatiently swerved around the truck to make better time. One shook his fist. It's a puny example of road rage if you're a dinosaur. <laughs> Here's another one from 1999 that's headlined, Blind Man Conquers His Own Mount Everest. Doug Davidson is blind, but each year at the Los Angeles County Fair, he has one goal clearly in sight. For 30 years, Davidson has visited the fair solely to climb to the top of the giant slide, glide down the wavy slide on a burlap mat, then climb the stairs to do it again and again. Davidson, 42, has made the slide his personal Everest. In 1998, he set a personal record of 60 trips. On opening day this year, he hit 61. The only reason he stopped then, said his dad, Ken Davidson, was that he wanted to see the Randy Travis concert. That many trips takes three to four hours. On Friday, Davidson returned to his favorite ride to shoot for 65 trips or more. He has trouble explaining his obsession with the giant slide, which may have begun as early as 1965, the year the attraction opened. Familiarity is one reason. Exercise from the repetitive climbing is another. Another reason? It's just plain fun, he said. It's like a breath of fresh air. It may be fall, but it's like a breath of spring. Ken Davidson said his son gets a taste of freedom on the slide the way a sighted person does behind the wheel of a car. By himself, Doug Davidson climbs the 95 steps to the top of the 50-foot slide. A slide employee lays out his mat. Davidson steps on, sits, pushes himself off, and rides silently down the four humps to the bottom. An employee, or his father, leads him to the steps so he can go again. That was 29, he'll say, to keep the number straight. 30 is next. Blind since birth, Davidson lived with his parents, Ken and Margaret, in Los Angeles. His life has been as normal as possible, his father said. He went to the movies with his two brothers. He was a kicker on his high school football team, which got him a letterman's jacket. A college graduate with a degree in communications, he plays the piano, reads braille, takes computer classes, swims, and competes in an annual marathon. He doesn't look at blindness as a handicap, his father said. He looks at his diabetes as a handicap because he likes to eat. His parents planned to cut him off at 66 trips because of low blood sugar so he could eat. Giant slide manager Nancy Maxwell, who's worked the ride for 23 years, lets Davidson on the $1.80 a trip attraction for free. He's a tradition of the slide, Maxwell said proudly. Her daughters grew up helping him. Other disabled people ride the slide, including people with Down syndrome and multiple sclerosis. But nobody is gung-ho like Doug, Maxwell said. Slide employee Michael Murakami was among those who helped Davidson lay out his mat Friday and opening day. It's unbelievable, Murakami said, 61 times up the stairs. Other people ride at most four or five times, he said. They're huffing and puffing. This guy does it like it's nothing. Jennifer Reed of Riverside, whose children were contemplating going down a second time, 
was delighted to hear about Davidson's feet. Oh my gosh, how fun, Reed said, watching Davidson on another trip down. She had a guess as to what a blind person would get out of the effort. It's the thrill, Reed said. Most people close their eyes when they go down it anyway. <laughs> All right, want a couple more? Yes. All right. The most outrageous one. <laughs> huh. Come on, we know there's one in there. Probably is. All right, well, first I'm going to read one that's maybe not that outrageous. Uh, this is also from 1999, uh, but I picked it because it's another Laverne one. Wild West wannabes hit the asphalt trail for the annual cattle drive. Remember the cattle drive? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Past a Baker Square they rode, within spitting distance of the bagelry, as suburban cowboys led 209 head of cattle Friday morning down the streets of Laverne. It was the annual cattle drive from the foothills to the Los Angeles County Fair, a popular publicity stunt that mixes the old and new West. Steers were herded from Laverne's Palmer Equestrian Facility to, Pom to Pomona's Fairgrounds, a seven-mile route. They passed gated subdivisions, tract homes, retail stores, and freeway construction. Asphalt streets standing in for the dusty trail. The event was no thundering stampede. The two-hour drive was more of a walk. Some 138 riders, most of them local horse owners, herded the steers which had been trucked in from a ranch in Santa Margarita for the occasion. Riders paid $150 for the adventure and said it was worth every penny. It's a blast, said Pam Heisinger, a 43-year-old supermarket checker from Walnut who has ridden in each drive since the 1996 debut. It's just so much fun that you keep coming back every year. Families lined the streets, traffic stopped, and construction workers gawked as riders herded the mooing steers down Wheeler Avenue past Baseline Road and Foothill Boulevard, then along Benita Avenue. People love a parade, said Doug Lofstrom, the Fairplex official who led the drive. That's what this is, a parade. For riders, the trick was negotiating paved streets. Manhole covers and other slick spots can trip up horses who wear metal shoes, said three-time rider Paula Miller of Laverne. Bushy mustache Dan Needham, who owns a direct mail advertising business, was one of many riders dressed in cowboy finery. A white hat, leather chaps, boots, and a gold star identifying him as Sheriff Dan. Needham, a 56-year-old San Dimas resident, is a horse lover who rides his quarter host, Shishi, each afternoon and goes on city slickers type cattle drives each year. Does he ever wish he'd lived in the Old West? Getting up at dawn and using an outhouse, that's not too appealing, Needham admitted. Dressing in western clothes and being around pals, that I like. The celebrity writer was a politician, Assemblyman Bob Marget, Republican from Arcadia. Marget, who dressed down in jeans, said after the ride that he'd had a great time, to a point. The people of the turn of the century were on cattle drives three or four months, Marget, 70, reflected. I was on it for three hours. That was probably enough for me. The biggest cheers came as the riders and steers passed the elementary school students lined up outside Oak Mesa School. Many of the young buckaroos wore cowboy hats and vests made from brown butcher block paper. <laughs> they kept up a continuous shriek of delight for several minutes straight as if they'd sighted in sync. Little kids' faces, that's worth all the time and trouble right there, two-time writer Gary Nichols of Altaloma said. In fact, it was, a re it was the reaction of a little girl last year that led to a new element of this year's drive. Nolina Prouty, age three, was pictured in the Daily Bulletin wearing a huge hat, riding a stick horse, and waving to riders from the sidelines. That inspired Lofstrom, Fairplex's vice president of operations, to invite students to ride stick horses behind the riders this year as they entered the fairgrounds horse track. More than 1,100 students, aged four to eight, signed up to participate, waiting outside the track gates to follow the riders in. Kindergarten students from Pomona's Kingsley Elementary School had perhaps the most elaborate stick horses, fashioned from cereal boxes, brown paper, and plastic pipe. Students enjoyed riding their horses and seeing real horses close up. I loved it, said Jennifer Sanchez, age five, who dubbed her horse Little Mermaid, 
I want to be a cowboy, declared five-year-old Alberto Berriman. I like the bulls and the horses. I dress like a cowboy and go to rodeos. Offering what might be a mixed message, would-be cowboy Alberto was also dressed in a Cleveland Indians cap. <laughs> Uh, all right, you wanted the most outrageous one? Okay, I haven't read this one out loud, so I might stumble a little bit, but this is from 2010. And I guess it's good enough for the newspaper. I guess it's good enough for Hillcrest, all right? Uh, Fair's cadaver display could be ugh, rated. <laughs> Called Our Body, the Universe Within, the LA County Fair exhibit may show a little more of the universe within than squeamish fairgoers would wish. Cadavers donated to science have been preserved through the miracle of plastic and placed on view for educational display, innards exposed. The results are eye-opening and possibly stomach-churning. It could be titled, Our Body, the Yuckiness Within. <laughs> I saw the exhibit one afternoon last week. But first things first, I had lunch. <laughs> it was less likely, I reasoned, that the exhibit would make me lose my lunch than that it would make me lose my appetite. Our body is under the grandstand. Signs warning against photography, cell phone use, and food or beverages. I imagine organ meats and beef ribs are double banned. Inside, dim lighting, velvet ropes, and spotlights are employed. The atmosphere, unlike almost anywhere else at the fair, is hushed. It's not quite a museum environment. Late in the exhibit, I could hear a horse race being announced. The first figure is labeled skeleton with joints and partially cut muscle and tendons. He's posed atop a bicycle, as if racing away from the examination table in mid-dissection. Another figure in the running position must be fleeing on foot from the same fate. All his muscles are attached but flayed away from the bone. What happened to him, a woman near me asked. It looks like he exploded. Some of the figures are reduced nearly to skeletons. Most look mummified with unrecognizable features. Each has pieces missing, the bones on that one and internal organs on another to allow us to see how they and we are put together. Diagrams explain what we're seeing. One standing figure is pretty much intact, except without skin. All you see are muscles, tendons, and nerves. He seemed to have been very fit. At any rate, he has great abs. <laughs> Evidently, no obese people are on display, other than among the paying guests. Another male cadaver is holding a baseball glove and appears to be making a catch. A smaller number of female cadavers are on display and are likewise posed in the altogether. Less energetic in their post-life than the males, the females tend to be at rest or standing. At least they aren't posed knitting or baking. <laughs> As for the males, one can't help noticing that sex organs are delicate but durable even in death. Emotion welled within me. I think it was pride. <laughs> Individual organs are also on display inside clear cases. A vertebrae, a pelvis, knee joints, and parts of the brain, for instance. The brain, by the way, looks undersized. Are all brains so small? <laughs> Perhaps it formerly belonged to one of our local elected officials. <laughs> a spinal cord and nerves look like a long, many-legged insect. Anyone with lower back trouble might feel a pang of sympathy eyeing the section labeled lumbar nerves. Like something from the butcher case, a tongue and pharynx sliced in half down the middle lie there inert but enormous. I almost clutched my throat. I was reminded of the peanut strip in which Linus told Lucy in horror he had suddenly become aware of his tongue. <laughs> After the tongue, my journey through our body brought me to the stomach, liver, and gallbladder. I seemed to be traveling southward, a fear confirmed by my movement to the small intestine and rectum. The nether regions rest in a case, each helpfully labeled for our detailed inspection. Did you know the rectum has a part known as the anal sinus? Next time someone passes gas, politely say, Gesundheit. 
One of the most remarkable sights in an exhibit full of them was a skeleton seated, legs crossed with its blood vessels still in place. A few draped across the skull, many more slithering over the rest of the bones. The appearance was of a skeleton being slowly overrun by gossamer, gossamer tendrils of red moss, and oddly beautiful. That was my feeling about the entire exhibit. If you can get past the ick factor, its effect is to make you appreciate just how fragile we are. So much stuff is shoehorned inside us. If we are luggage, God is the master packer. That it's a wonder most of us function at all. I found myself not only aware of my tongue, but of the joints, muscles, and other mechanisms enabling me to walk through the exhibit. The effect, thankfully, wears off or would be too self-conscious to do anything, but the impression lingers. The audience included a lot of medical students, based on technical discussions I could hear, but also included lots of ordinary adults, a disconcerting number of whom brought in young children. Few fairgoers seem to have demanded their money back. Some 60,000 have seen the exhibit, and response has been positive, fair spokeswoman Sharon Autry said. Getting inside our body is $7, or $5 if paid online, as part on top of your fair admission. That fee and the visuals outside the hall were designed to keep people from simply wandering in without knowing what they were getting themselves in for, a fair official said. Several competitors mount exhibits of so-called plastinated cadavers. You may have seen them at the Natural History Museum in LA where the inaugural 2004 exhibit caused a sensation. While such exhibits have been shown in museums around the world, this is said to be the first at a county fair. Another first for Pomona. Our body ends with restrooms. I did not hear the sound of retching. Followed by a case about 18 feet long containing a human body in half inch horizontal slices, each spaced apart an inch and standing on edge like cuts of meat. It does not increase your desire for a steak. On the way out, you pass professionals from hospitals and medical schools ready to answer questions, or perhaps fan you if you're feeling faint. Mad Magazine used to bill itself deprecatingly as the number one ech magazine, based on its supposed nauseating qualities. Our body, the universe within, ought to proudly adopt a related slogan. The LA County Fair's number one ech exhibit. <laughs> All right, is that outrageous enough for you? Yeah. <laughs> All right, should I do one more? All right. Cool. All right, I'll read this one from uh, September of 2020. Um, this is the, and the headline for this is, no fair, LA County Fairgrounds silent instead of lively. I've happily attended every LA County Fair since my arrival here in 1997. But my annual tradition, and perhaps yours too, has fallen by the wayside. Pomona's Fair isn't taking place this year for the first time in 73 years, another victim of coronavirus. Fair CEO Miguel Santana wouldn't venture a guess as to whether the fair will take place in 2021 and it didn't, as you might recall. Although he certainly hopes 2022, the fair centennial is a go. It's hard to predict anything, Santana told me. There will always be a need for people to gather and celebrate the best of Southern California. It's been that for 100 years. Hope we can start up that tradition next year and for the next 100 years. I was at the fairgrounds on Monday evening for a tour with Santana and spokeswoman Renee Hernandez. Does this count as keeping my attendance streak alive? I felt it was important to honor the loss of an event that drew 1.1 million guests last year, employs 500 seasonal employees, and pumps $58 million into the city's economy. The fair needed this fan's fanfare. The fair would have opened Friday and run through September 27th. On a Monday like this before our Friday opening, the grounds would have been almost a 24-7 operation, Hernandez told me. Instead, we were virtually the only people on the grounds. The midway was devoid of games of chance and carnival rides. The bumpiest ride is 2020 itself. The Garden Railroad, the model railroading layout, had no trains. The exhibit halls were devoid of cakes, preserves, and crocheting submissions. The colorful structures in what was once known as Fiesta Village were taking a siesta. 
It's a weird feeling to be here and not be seeing anything, Hernandez said. It's kind of peaceful in an eerie way, Santana observed. He walks the grounds at dusk a couple of nights a month. There are times, he said, it seems like a zombie movie. We passed through the flower and garden pavilion, empty of flower and garden. The grandstand's 10,000 seats for concert goers were unoccupied and would stay that way. No need to hold a seat for a friend. The farm had no animals, almost. One bard had its year-round chickens and turkeys who clucked away. Electric fans were blowing. To my, combination, to my ears, the combination sounded like a sitcom's laugh track to our conversation. It was incongruous, but welcome. I was relieved to not see the sky ride, the ski lift style transport. Last year, Santana persuaded me to ride with him and your acrophobic columnist consented, quickly finding himself 70 feet off the ground, legs dangling. A year later, my knuckles are still white. The fair was canceled in May under orders from Los Angeles County to limit crowds. Even permission for a drive through fair, as Orange County is doing, was denied. OC's positivity rate is lower than LA County's, explained Santana, who noted that we're still leading the cases, the state in cases in LA County. Without the fair or its other events, nonprofit Fairplex has pivoted towards using its space to serve the community. The 240-room Sheridan Hotel has been hosting firefighters and other first responders who must quarantine. A drive through food pantry takes place in the drag strip, serving up to 2,000 families a week. The daycare center is watching the children of nurses, firefighters, and supermarket employees for free. drive through COVID-19 tests occur at gate 17. We were able to transition our purpose to what the community needed when it needed it, Santana said. The fair furloughed 85% of its 150-person permanent staff. Executives, including Santana, took pay cuts of 25 to 50 percent. Health insurance is still being provided to employees at least through December 31st. St. Hannah's CEO since 2017 is leaving when his contract expires in January. He recommended that the chief financial officer assume the role of interim CEO until a pandemic is over to save money. This will be our reality for all of this year and maybe all of next year. We have to hunker down and protect the assets in St. Hannah, who spends his days talking to bankers about refinancing debt, from construction of the hotel and conference center and finding passive sources of revenue like the rental cars that are parked at Blue Gate. It's not fun, Santana said. This time of year, I'd have the excitement of having a million people come to the campus. This is not what I expected, but it's necessary. What would the 2020 fair have been like? Shorter, it would have started later each day, 4 p.m. rather than noon on Wednesdays and Thursdays, 11 a.m. rather than 10 a.m. Fridays to Sundays, in an attempt to avoid the worst of the September heat. 2019's attendance drooped along with fairgoers as the, final three, as the first three weeks of September saw average daily highs of 93 degrees. No wonder they moved to May. New shade structures in the midway and farm would have been added to give walkers a break. The theme was to be We Light the Night, an attempt to capitalize on more comfortable nighttime temperatures by adding lighted art installations and more entertainment and country singer Toby Keith was booked to perform. As we walked around on Monday, the weather was warm, but very pleasant. Of course the weather is perfect, St. Hannah said ruefully. I told someone it better get hot later. That would be the perfect 2020 capstone, perfect weather when the fair would be going on, and it's not going on. He can relax. Every day this weekend is predicted to be 100 degrees or above. The fair last closed on September 11, 2001 and reopened the next day. The last time there was no fair at all was during World War II. From 1942 to 1947, the grounds were used for such purposes as a holding center for Japanese-American internees before they were shipped to internment camps, and as a prisoner of war camp for German and Italian-Americans. Six years without a fair, that's a sobering thought. But here's a bright prospect. When the fair returned in 1948, Hernandez said, that was the first year the fair had a million attendants. People were probably just clamoring for something fun to do after all that. Yep. All right. All right. Well, I hope I didn't read too many, because uh, I do want to take questions for whatever time we have left. Um, so it can be about the fair, it could be about Laverne or local history it could be about newspapers or my job or career or whatever. Um, yeah. Okay. Do I have? Yes, I have. I have copies of. 
of all four, but primarily of the county fair book. Yeah. Well, that was loud. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, like Superman, strange visitor from another planet. Uh, right. <laughs> no, she wouldn't know where I was before '97. Uh, well, I was in Victorville for three years, and uh, so I'm from Illinois originally, and um, uh, came to California after graduating from college. And lived in Sonoma County up north. Um, worked for uh, small papers in Santa Rosa, then Roanoke Park in Petaluma. Um, yeah, and then and then Victorville, and then came to Ontario to Daily Bulletin for a job, and thought I'd be here for a year or two and move on somewhere else. And what school did you go to? Uh, went to University of Illinois Thank in Champaign Urbana. Go Illini. <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, years ago, they've always had the horse races there at the fairground. And for some reason, they stopped them. But um, do you think there will ever be a chance to have them start back up again? All right. Uh, she's asking about why the horse races stop and if they'll ever begin again. Um, well, yeah, they're never coming back. And I mean, they stop. Uh, and I forget because it's not something I I wrote about because other people at paper were doing it. But as I recall, like the basically the I mean, the track was not really the right length that everybody liked. Um, like I think the turns were, it was short and the turns were too sharp. And um, horse racing being somewhat on the decline anyway, uh, right like it's a Hollywood Park I think that closed and that's why we have SoFi Stadium. Um, you know, there's just fewer people interested in horse racing than there used to be. Um, so the people who organize these things decided not to give Fairplex any dates. I mean, so it just went away. Um, so it's like newspapers. <laughs> it's not. It's not coming back. Um, so if, you must have been a fan. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't. You know. I don't. It wasn't really the fairplexes. They didn't kill it. Yeah. You know. It was the. the I'm, they, I think it was less lucrative as time went on. But it was the whoever it is who assigns dates for these things um, decided to not give dates to Pomona anymore. So. Do you have any baseball stadium plans to add to your list for this year? Uh, yeah, she asked if I have any baseball stadium plans uh, for this year. Um, yeah, for people who, or to remind anybody or tell you for the first time, um, I have written about how I have a long-term goal of going to all 30 major league stadiums, and I've been to 14 so far. Um, I don't think I even really ever mention this in my column till I got to 10 or 11 because I, you know, it was kind of a casual thing. But, you know, once I got into double digits, it was like, all right, I'll, I'll mention that I did this <laughs> and that I'm doing this. Uh, so like this last year, I went to um, Kansas City and then to both stadiums in New York. Um, so that got me from 11 to 14. Um, so whatever the next one is, I'll be halfway. Uh, I don't have any, I haven't really planned ahead yet as to what one or ones I might do um, other than like the the one like the closest one that I have not been to is San Francisco you know for the reason when I, whenever I've been there it's usually after the season's over or it's ending or hasn't started yet or you know something but I'm pretty confident I'll be going San Francisco this year I'm going to make a point of it especially like I root for the because I'm from Illinois from downstate Illinois root for St. Louis Cardinals uh, still, uh, and St. Louis is going to be in, playing the Giants in late April, so I'm, I have my eye on that for uh, for when I might go to San Francisco. And beyond that, I'm not sure, but um, I think every summer I go visit my parents in Illinois, and uh, it's I usually try to work out some trip that relates to, you know, so like I'm already two thirds of the way across the country, you know, where can I go? It's almost like a local trip to go somewhere, Kansas City last time I took the train from St. Louis. Um, so I'll figure out something. I have this idea of, I don't know if I will do it this time, but like go to, we, can you look at the map to see where the stadiums are, the cities are, you know, like Toronto, Detroit, and Cleveland are all like 
not really that far from each other. Like they're closer than you might think if you don't look at, if you're not familiar with them. So I have this idea about hitting all three, like on a road trip or train trip, but but if not this year, another year. I heard you speak at the Rotary Club of Claremont six, nine months ago, something like that. And it seems like you told us about some event that took place at Chino or Chino Hills, a city meeting, and whether I have that one right or not, I'm just wondering if in your years of reporting you've ever had a case where somebody uh, was upset with you reporting what you knew to be fact, but they didn't want it, didn't want it out published like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think mean, every any reporter you could you could be in your you could have worked at the paper for a month you would have had a circumstance like that probably but certainly in three decades plus yeah um i don't know you know sometimes it's like the the older like the incidents that happened earlier in your life or your career the ones that like are more memorable than something that might have happened a month ago but i mean i remember being at like my first newspaper and uh there was a Let's see, there was a school bond on the ballot and it was gonna um, extend a tax that was already in place, you know, that was ex sunsetting and then this was gonna extend it. So like the headline, which I actually wrote for my piece in advance of the election was um, like voters choice um, school bond or tax cut, which is basically what it would be. Like, I mean, you'd either vote for this or you would not vote for it and you wouldn't, your taxes would go down. But I remember the, I guess it was the election night, like being in some watch party and the school board president, you know, <laughs> getting in my face and reading me out like, you know, if this fails, you know, I'm blaming you for this and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it was like kind of a, it actually, you'd be, it didn't actually bother me as much as you might <laughs> think that it would, even though I had only been doing this for maybe a year or so. It was a, in part like it was, I don't know, it was a small like kind of audience of sorts, like, Listening, including a fellow reporter from a bigger paper who I was friends with. So like I, he was having a good time <laughs> listening, watching this. And also the, the square president, like he, I don't know, his, somebody's eyes, like he, well, he, he was actually an albino and like he, I mean, like pink and, you know, and his eyes were just kind of like darting around. Um, so like if you'd, if you'd actually been like looking me in the eye the whole time, I might have been quaking, but since his eyes were kind of going all over, it was easy to just kind of stand there and nod and look serious. <laughs> anyway, the school bond passed, so I, I didn't get blamed. <laughs> yeah. I, Having uh, gone to the fair, it seemed like my entire life, it was always every year a go-to place. In fact, the fair was probably one of the largest county fairs in the nation. And we've seen, unfortunately though, as time has gone on, a lot of changes and, and not all of them are ones that we at our stage of life uh, really appreciate. But I think we need to be much, very much aware of what the planning is for the next 10 years of that fairgrounds. And, uh, having attended a meeting a couple of months ago uh, showing how they're going to reconfigure the fairgrounds into housing and all kinds of other uh, social uh, uh, construction. Uh, what we know is the fairgrounds and the parking and the uh, uh, operation of it is going to dramatically change. And uh, I think we need to be aware of that because uh, I think uh, there may be a time down the line where the fair may not be anywhere near what it is if it exists at all. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree with all that. And I think your voice is loud enough. I, I can't summarize that, so I assume, hope everybody heard that. But yeah, there there's kind of long range plans that they've had community meetings about, about how to make better use of portions of the fairgrounds, especially the parking lots. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are plans for housing and uh, parks and maybe some, I think some retail shops, and, you know, which will remind long timers of, you know, like late nineties, that was, there was plans to do that along, um, I think along McKinley uh, and it, everybody kind of hooted it down and it went away. Uh, but this seems more serious and more um, substantial. Um, 
our my Javier Rojas from our paper who covers Pomona and Laverne. Like he's written a couple of stories about it um, in the last year, I think. Um, so that some I so most of what I know about it is just from his stories. But I mean, I agree that people should be paying attention to it. And I don't. I'm not sure I totally understand the ramifications of it myself. Um, but um, I will say just um, that. I mean, there's, there's a lot of asphalt at the fair, and there is, a, you know, with more people Ubering in and think, you know, I mean, the idea is that the trend is probably there will be less need for parking in the future. Uh, but uh, I guess the other thing is just that with the way uh, how agriculture is barely exists in LA County anymore, and with a couple of years without the fair, you kind of realize how fragile maybe the fair is and these things that we kind of take for granted that they're always going to be there that maybe they won't be there you know 20 50 years from now who, who's to say you know we had a couple years without a fair uh, and and you know <laughs> um and it was kind of devastating uh for them certainly and you realize that it's not as yeah you know, I don't want to call it a house of cards. I mean, it's, that's a bit strong, but you realize that it's, you know, these things are not guaranteed to happen perpetually. Um, so it's worth supporting the fair. If you if you want to give the fair your money, you know, every May uh, and enjoy it while it's here, uh, no matter how it's changing, but you know, they're trying to adapt to changing times and keep it going, you know. I will say, my wife and I are homeowners across the street from the north side of the fair. We walk to the fair every single day that it's open. We go in. Um, we're huge fans. Um, but I will say that once you go in the pedestrian entrance that's there on Laverne Avenue, half the blue lot is completely empty hmm. until you get down where the tram station is. It's a good five to ten minute walk to get to where there's any cars parked whatsoever. So I understand the nervousness about change. I personally share that. But there is a huge amount of real estate. I'm just throwing this out there that I don't mind if the folks in charge are thinking about what they can do with that real estate. I don't know. I don't know if they're making the right decisions or not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember, maybe, and you might remember, I, I don't know, 10 years ago or at some point where they, they pulled in the kind of northern boundary of the fair right. um, to make it more, a little bit more compact. And that was created more parking. And as you say, it, some of that parking may not really even be needed now. Um, you know, so. Thank you, David. Yes. Thank you for coming today. Um, well, I kind of had to. I was on the bill, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and along with that, too, don't forget in a couple of years, 2025, the gold line's going to be here. And we're going to have that bridge going from our station in Laverne over to you know, the Fairplex. So people, yeah. that's going to cut down on the parking needs, too, at the Fairplex. But what I wanted to ask you, over the years, my husband and I, we've gone since day one, never missed a year. And, since um, 1922? That's amazing. You look, <laughs> you look very nice, good for 100. So <laughs> it's been very special. Even my dad used to take us. But all of us are at the age where I think you remember those little tickets we would get at school. And so if you went during the week, you could you know, get in free. And we had seven children in our family, so my dad loved those tickets. But, you know, so I've seen so much transition over the years. Being on the city council for many years, I also saw how the fairplex, the growth that went through, and then how the decline started, even before the pandemic. Now, what I noticed this past year, which I'm in very much favor of the fair being in the spring now. I think May this past year when I went, it was so nice. The weather was so much cooler. The heat just gets too bad. But do you see, and with over the years that you've covered it, do you see the fair growing once again up to where it was this past year, 2022, you know, expectedly? that it um, really cut back to what they had exhibits, halls, and you know, um, they just, the food vendors, everything was cut back. Do you think with time it's gonna grow or do you think it's a diminishing? Um, well, that's a good question. And I would, um, they were certainly like trying to ramp back, I mean, at least what they would say was that they were trying to ramp back up and so they weren't at full staff and they were trying to kind of re reconnect with certain things and um, so I would imagine that the coming fair will be bigger 
you know, but um, kind of like with horse racing, you know, is it ever, is it going to come back to where there's a million people, you know, 1.1 million people there again? I don't know. Actually, you know, what I f thought was really interesting about the Ferris uh, attendance numbers this last year, and I don't know, I didn't, well, I mean, I can't, I can't account for it, I don't really know, but, you know, instead of 1.1 million, it was like 500 and some thousand, and it was like, what happened to those other 600 and some thousand people? Were those all like the free tickets that they gave to kids? And they weren't doing that this year? I mean, so like, it was never, like, was it never 1.1 million paid attendance? Was that kind of a mirage to begin with? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but it was, uh, I mean, if they were being more transparent this year about the numbers, that was welcome, but I don't have an explanation for what the numbers mean. Yeah. Well, like I said, it was like maybe 600,000 attendants instead of, I mean, like about half of a normal fare. Okay. Um, well, I'll be in the back selling any books, um, which are $22 each, um, take cash or credit card or debit card. Um, but also encourage anybody who doesn't take the paper that you can, if you're techy enough, that you can get an online only subscription for I mean, we actually have a deal right now that I think is still in place where it's ten dollars for the entire year, uh, but but generally the the price is um, like fifteen dollars a month, so it's like fifty cents a day, so uh, more like prices that you remember. <laughs> but this is again like online only. You can read anything you want. You read the e edition, which is the print replica. Um, anyway. Four hundred dollars a year now. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, thanks to everybody for showing up and to the Laverne Historical Society for having me.